Good morning again, folks. I hope you're all doing well. Today, it's uh, six weeks, I'm counting, uh, since I've been anywhere other than summer for groceries. Um, I don't know how it's been for you. I, I know Ruth is really hating it at the minute. She really loves being out and about. That's her thing. That's what she does all, all the time. Um, I'm really hoping it's not because she's locked in with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm really trying hard not to pull up that thread. Uh, but I'm actually having a great time. I'm spending more time with uh, my family than I ever would have under normal circumstances. Uh, I work from home most of the time anyway. So while, yes, of course, I miss you all. I miss getting together in the church. I, I miss worshiping together. I'm making the most of it and I think the weather's definitely helped. Family, dog walks and playing in the garden has all been brilliant. And, God has been good. I want us to keep going with our, our series on running on empty because I recognise that some of you are really feeling it at the moment. And that could be coming from relational emptiness, being lonely, being cut off, while others are feeling the financial emptiness, being furloughed, self-employed, depending on what the specifics for you are. Perhaps you're feeling spiritually empty uh, because of not being at church, not being able to worship, having that fellowship. Uh, Maybe it's an emotional emptiness. You're, you're bored or you're stressed. You're anxious. You're, you're worried uh, whether it's because you know people who are working sort of front line at the minute with the virus or uh, it's just stressful working with your spouse or living close in quarters, whatever it is. The idea behind this series is to do more than simply say, hey, look, it's OK. Have faith. It's OK. Have hope. What I want to do is practically guide you through some steps um, to make sure that not only you have enough in the tank to get you through this, but that we can learn principles that when, whenever we get back to whatever normal is going to be like in the future, we've got principles in place to make sure that we're not picking up bad habits again once we get back to this new normal. That you're not going to waste this time then. I want you to be able to use this time to refuel, recharge, because it could be, and I believe this is true, that there's some of you who have been running on empty um, before this happened and now you're having to sit back and to pause and reflect. In our first message in the series, we looked at lightening our load. Some of us are carrying weights that we were never meant to carry. That's going to make sure that you empty your tank. You're not going to get many miles to the gallon when you're overloaded. At uh, the weekend there, we talked about starting the day with the full tank, because unless we start our day with God, unless we start with that full tank, it doesn't matter what else we try to do. We're going to be running on fumes sooner rather than later. Today, I want to look at another reason you could be running on empty, and that's driving too rashly. If we want to make sure we have enough in the tank, that enough to see us through the whole journey, we need to drive economically. Now, I'm not afraid to admit to you that I've been on the speed awareness course twice. Uh, they're really good. I just can't get enough of them. <sighs> one of the things, though, that they did talk about in the last one that I was on was that when you accelerate hard and have to break hard, not only does the science say that you don't actually save very much time going through uh, towns and built up areas, but all you do is you get stressed and you use up your fuel. And the science says that it's more economical. You save money and time by driving at a sensible pace. So sure enough, actually, since then, I found that driving at a steady pace, making as few gear changes, varying my speed as little as possible, it's far better than just racing between junctions. That by slowing down to a better speed, it's meant that I'm getting further with the fuel that I have. I haven't really lost time on my journeys. But in fact, I arrive a few minutes, maybe a few minutes later, but I arrive calm, relaxed, ready, focused. But this is how we live our lives, right? We rush, 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 rush. But what kind of motors causes most accidents? It's the ones who rush. The ones who try to use every lane on the M2 or the West Link, trying to get ahead of one car, darting in and out of lanes. Is that 30 seconds really going to make much of a difference? No, but... That's the pace we live our lives. It's the ones who are trying to drive while they're using their phone because they have to reply to that text. They have to see what's going on. Or the people who are trying to drive while they eat or drive while they put on their makeup or drive while they do all of the above at the same time. You know who you are. Because we're in such a rush. It's not working for us. 
Now, this virus lockdown is serious and what's happening is it's difficult to fully grasp that in the UK over 22,000 people have died because of it. Last week we were hearing numbers of 700, 800 people a day dying because of it. And one of the things that has happened is that this virus has made us slow down. We have to, by law, live at a different pace. And, and it infuriates me no end that some people don't seem to get this. We stay apart now so that when we get back together, everyone can be there. But a marker of our life before lockdown was that we were going about stressed, overscheduled. We, there was no balance between our work lives and our home lives. And church maybe even has a factor to blame that because we have a full schedule normally. And we've had to slow down as well. But listen, whenever we rush and rush, it doesn't matter how much fuel you have in, in your tank at the start of the day, you can't change the size of your tank. Frantically running around is going to just make you empty that tank faster. Being busy doesn't make, give you a bigger tank. Someone once said that if you can't burn the candle at both ends, you're just not as bright as you think you are. The Bible does give us a couple of warnings about being hurried. I've identified five of them for us um, with a solution for each and will not take long with each. Five problems. Hurry brings hassle, it takes happiness, it hinders, it depletes your heart and it keeps you from God's hand. That's your five. So the first reason then hurry can have us running on empty is that it causes hassle. We like to think that hurry prevents hassle, that if we can go faster and faster and faster, we can cram more in, and that's a good thing. But it's not. Listen to Song of Solomon 1 verse 6 in the NIV. It says, Do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm tanned by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. Now hear that last bit. I had to neglect my own stuff. I was so busy doing what everyone else was wanting me to do. I took on so many commitments that I suffered. I have been sunburned, working hard for everyone else, but I've neglected myself. Now, anyone at home want to say, yes, I've been running around, running after everyone else, that I've neglected my own health as a result? Because we always think we can fit more in. We can do more and more and more. Hurry invites us to take as much on as possible to try and achieve fullness or satisfaction. So what's the solution to this? I think it's in Philippians 4.11. Paul is in prison and he writes these well-known words. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. When we're stressed and running around, always feeling we're a day late and a quid short, the solution is to learn to be content. Now, two things about this first. Number one, being content doesn't come naturally to us as adults. Sure, it doesn't. I mean, whenever we see someone who isn't hurrying around, who isn't being busy, who's just content, they're being lazy. But yet being content comes more naturally to children. That's why they're happy to play with chalk on a pavement or a cardboard box instead of the iPhone or instead of the holidays or instead of the expensive outfits and accessories. We have unlearned the secret of contentment but what has been unlearned can be learned again right Paul says I've learned to be content now I don't know what your motivations are that push you and push you and push you to be so busy is it simply just money in the bank is there an unrealistic bucket list that you're trying to work through I know people who work way too hard because they need four weeks away on holiday every year two blocks of two weeks and, and it's always summer really far away really expensive and a big hotel and the same person will say Jeff you know I need those holidays I work so hard and then I'll say well why are you working so hard because oh, I have to pay for those holidays it's a vicious cycle and it's emptying the tank working hard to pay for holidays that you need because you're working so hard you're going to run out of fuel fast if that's the logic you live your life by and look by the way Ambition is a good thing. It's needed, it's important, but ambition out of control is destructive because everyone thinks ambition in any form is good. It's not. It depends on what is driving that motivate, uh, that ambition, what, what motivates it. If ambition is motivated by greed or jealousy or guilt, that's not healthy. A lot of ambitious people I know are driven by a sense of insecurity. That if they don't provide a lifestyle, well, then their wife's going to leave them. If they don't earn enough, their friends won't respect them. If they don't volunteer for everything, then the church won't think they're devout enough. Listen, you will never prove your worth by your own works. 
You will never prove your worth by your works because your worth is defined by Christ. You'll never learn to be content when you think that rushing and rushing and rushing is going to lead to a sense of satisfaction. All it does is lead to an empty tank to burn out. The key to learning how to be content is learning who we belong to. We belong to Christ. And because of the cross, because of what he has done for us, because of his work, we are accepted, we are loved, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says we are worth dying for. So learning to be content is simply not saying, okay, I'm just going to do less because experience has told me, and I'm sure it's told you, that normally we just find a way of filling that up with other stuff. It gets filled back up again. We need to be able to get to a place where we can say, actually, what I'm doing is enough because my worth isn't built on this, it's on Christ. Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body. Envy rots the bones. Don't worry about what other people are doing, about how much they can give or how much they can spend. Like that's their battleground. More than ever with this culture of comparison, I blame it totally on social media. I think even more so with this lockdown. Oh, look, Sanders taught her children Mandarin while my two are out the bag eating sticks that they find. Or, oh, look, they've redecorated their whole house. We haven't been able to do that. Picture after picture of filtered, edited pictures were... You know, that have only been posted after 30 attempts to get it just right. It's so fake. But we chase the likes and the shares and the thumbs up. And like, I'm not on social media apart from a wee bit now. Um, I'm taking a lead on the Facebook page in the church um, and here on YouTube. And I'll confess, since doing that, I find myself checking more and more often how many people have liked this? How many people have shared it? How many people have viewed it? And it's a toxic place to be. I don't like the person it's trying to make me become. Comparison kills contentment. So slow down. Hurry less. Drive more sensibly. Your tank will last longer. Second one. Hurry causes hassle, but it also curtails happiness. Job 9.25 says, my days are swifter than a runner. They fly away with a glimpse of joy. See, whenever we're rushing around so busy like maniacs, it steals our joy because we can't stop the savor right now. We're always in the future. We're always kind of looking 10 minutes ahead or half an hour ahead or our next meeting or our next thing that we have to do. And it's like a maniac driving on the motorway at 100 miles an hour, screaming at everyone to get out of the way. And they can't take in the scenery. They can't take on what's on the radio. They can't enjoy the present. Someone on a bike will enjoy the scenery more than that person driving. Walkers even more again, because the slower you go, the more you can take in of where you are right now. So what's the solution then? How do we hold on to happiness in a world that wants us to go faster and faster and faster and faster? Well, solution one, learn to be content. Solution two, learn to say no. You have no idea how much time you'll save by not doing a whole lot of stuff. Now, it sounds easy, but there are some people addicted to that fast pace of life. Maybe you know some. They can't sit. They can't stop. There's always a project. There's always a plan. There's always a scheme. There's always something happening in their lives. And they keep going because when they sit still, there's this darkness that comes in. Whether it's depression or anxiety or guilt, it could be so many different things, but I see people trying to run so fast. I have to wonder, what is it you're running from? Why are you so unable to slow down? You will burn out. That is not the solution to whatever's going on. Proverbs 20, 25 tells us it is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later to consider one's vows. I love the Proverbs. The Bible here is telling us that making rash commitments, saying yes to everything, it's a trap. Someone once said, it's always easier to get in than to get out. And that's that's true, right? It's easier to get into debt than out of debt. It's easier to get into a bad relationship than to get out of that bad relationship. It's easier to get into trouble than out of trouble. It's easier to put on weight than to get it off again. It's easier to fill the schedule than to fulfill the schedule. And one of the best lessons I have ever learned in this job as pastor is that just because you have a gap in your timetable doesn't mean it's a gap that has to be filled. You can't keep adding to your commitments without subtracting somewhere else. If you put too many irons in the fire, you'll eventually put out the fire. So we have to be careful about how many things we commit to. 
I try and see a pattern in my schedule. I, I try to keep my to-do list. Yes, that can change and, and happen throughout the week. But a really helpful thing that I find to do is my what matters most list, my priority list. What goes on that? Well, again, it depends. It can vary from week to week. But before I commit to anything, I say, okay, is this worth my time that could go elsewhere? Will I be able to fulfill the other commitments that I have already made? Can I spare that extra energy? Can I put my name and my reputation on it and be okay with that? And whenever I realize that, I say, well, actually, maybe it's not worth it. But how do you learn to say no? Well, thankfully, the Bible tells us. It's in Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. I don't know if you've read this or or seen this before, but it's so important. The Bible tells us, look, how to say no. Uh, Titus 2, let's read it. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. In this present age, it teaches us to say no to a lot of things, including living self-controlled lives. I wonder if you think of it as grace when you say no. Well, maybe unpack this a wee bit more in another study, but think of the parable of the great banquet in Luke 14. Listen to these verses again. Verse 16 of Luke 14. Man prepared a great feast, sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Did you see what was going on there? They're making excuses, but they're not lying. They're not saying something that isn't true. But what's happening here is they've got so many other things going on. It's impacting their priorities. And so I've got these commitments, so I can't balance it all. I can't say. And they've received the invite. Despite them accepting that invitation, they've missed out on the king's fellowship and reward and blessing because they couldn't say no to other things that were going on. There was a cost to not being able to say no. They filled their schedule. They couldn't fulfill their schedule. Their lives lacked good grace and they missed out. So first problem, hurry brings hassle. So the solution is to learn contentment. Problem two, hurry curtails our happiness. So we should learn to say no, create space for what really matters. The third problem that we have with rushing around is that it hinders. Rushing around is not the same as being productive. There's this myth going around that we should all be multitaskers. It is scientifically impossible to multitask. It's proven. Ladies, you're included in this. I know you like to think that you're different. No, you're included. You cannot give multiple things equal attention at the same time. Now, some people are really good at switching their focus between things very quickly, but that's not multitasking. Think about it, when you try to split yourself so many ways between different things, nobody ever really gets your full attention. So you're kind of cheating the system then. You're never really completely there with people because you're always switching focus. You're always, oh, okay, I need to get to the next thing. Oh, what happened in that last one? And you're always kind of balancing things. And for those who think that you are good at multitasking, let me ask you this. Who is it that you're cheating? Who doesn't get your full attention? I'm going to suggest that a fair chance is that it's your family. It's your relationships that suffer, right? You, okay, you're, you're with the family, but you're on the phone. You're checking your emails. You're, you're, you're with them, but your head is elsewhere. You're, you're robbing your family of your full attention, your full presence. Proverbs 19.2, enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. Now, we've seen this, right? People in a rush are more likely to be careless, either whether it's driving and they make mistakes or they mismeasure ingredients when they're cooking or they leave something behind when they rush out the door. Having watched long term successful people, I can tell you this, the people who have lasting success pace themselves. The marathons have been cancelled and I know some of you are really gutted about that. I'm not one of them. But um, in the marathons, they'll have professional pace setters. They'll let you know how fast you should be going if you're aiming for a four-hour time or a five-hour time or a six-hour time or whatever it happens to be. So what's the solution? I think we need to build into our week a Sabbath. Now, 
again, I'm probably going to take on a whole other message to focus in on the idea of, of the Sabbath. But here's the gist. Having a Sabbath is one of the top ten. One of the ten commandments. Resting is a command. It's in there with don't murder people and don't commit adultery. In fact, it's a top five. It comes into the charts at number four, which means if you do not have a Sabbath, you are sinning because you're breaking one of the top ten commandments. Now, for those who are self-employed, for the students in the church who, who skip church to work on homeworks and, and all that there, you're not keeping a Sabbath. And, and I've been guilty of this as well, of working seven days a week, of trying to fit it all in. But once I started calling it a Sabbath, in my head, not just a day off, it becomes more ring-fenced. The Sabbath is to rest our bodies. It's to renew our family ties, to revitalize our hearts. It's to refresh our souls by meeting together to worship. It's there for our emotions, our fellowship. And look, lions by themselves can't do that. Watching TV isn't going to do that. If you're too busy for time with God, then you're too busy full stop. Because hurrying will lead to mistakes. So slow down, stop, reflect, live at a smarter pace so that your heart, your soul, your relationships can get what they need. Proper focus, proper care. I heard about one pastor and he refused to meet with a member on a Monday because that was his day off, his Sabbath. And the member said, but pastor, you know, Satan doesn't take a day off. To which the pastor says, well, then if I, took it, if I didn't take a day off, I'd just be like him then. Christ took the time. We should as well. Christ himself said that man wasn't created for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. God has given us the command for our benefit. Folks, keep a Sabbath, especially in these circumstances when all the days blend together. Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. He grants sleep to those he loves. Hurry brings hassle. Learn to be content. Hurry robs our happiness. Learn to say no. Hurry hinders. Learn to take a Sabbath. Live at a better pace. Let the Lord build the house. Number four. Hurry keeps me from God's hands. What I mean by that is when I'm running around and trying and trying and trying and trying, it leads me to tend to trust God less. I get impatient. I want to do it my way, my timing. I want to set my own pace. Remember Abraham and Hagar? God promised Abraham and Sarah a child, but they decided that they couldn't wait any longer. And history shows us that was a disaster. And it all could have been avoided if they had hurried less, if they were just had slowed down. Remember our verse from our last message? Be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46, 10. Hurrying can't coexist with being still. There's a saying that says, good things come to those who wait. I wonder if you believe that. I wonder if you actually think it's a spiritual principle. It is. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he makes everything beautiful in his time. See, there's a difference between a meal that gets dinged into the microwave and something that, like a nice slow cooked roast beef. Good things come to those who wait. Sometimes faster isn't better. I heard someone say that if God wants mushrooms, he'll take six hours. But if he wants oak trees, he'll take six decades. Folks, God has a plan for your life. And we all tend to believe that in some sense, but what we can't always get is his timing. His time skill is rarely like ours. But he makes everything beautiful in his time. So this then comes down to trust. When we hurry, we can be tempted to think that God doesn't care or has failed us because hurry makes us impatient. And that takes us away from resting in him, being still and knowing he is God. It takes us away from then casting our cares on him, from trusting in his sovereign will, his sovereign plan, his perfect timing. Slow down. Trust in God not in yourself and number five to finish hurry hardens your heart when we spend all day running from schedule to schedule if every time you speak your family to speak to your family you're starting off by saying okay but make it quick listen yes i can't stay long right hurry up we've got to be there we've got to be at the church in 10 minutes right come on we've got to if that's how your your language is framed in the home that stops you from being loving because you're always minimizing the time that we think we can waste on relationships sure sure we'll always have these people but we need to get along because i need to go into the office I, I need to go do this with job i need to make this happen i need to go do this 
and we always kind of push people away because we're so hurried, we're minimizing the time that we truly spend with them. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 closes by saying, And if I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. That's a real challenge to people who are always so busy. What's the solution then? How do we stop hurriedly emptying our tank and leaving us emotionally and relationally empty? The answer is to use love as a filter for our priorities. The best way to manage your time, your money, your energy, your resources, your schedules, all of it is love. Ephesians 5 2 says, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Here's how I think that works. When we're given a choice between two commitments or, or two options, you choose the one that's the most loving. Not the one that suits you best necessarily, but we tried to shape our schedule about what characterizes walking in the way of love. First Corinthians 16, 14 simply says that all that you do be done in love. Do it all with love. Make sure your schedule reflects your and your commitments reflect the fact that you love God that you love your neighbours, that you love your family, you love your spouse. And the best way to prioritise all these things in your life without burning out is to ask this big question. And this question is, what is the loving thing to do here? What's the loving thing to do right now? See, in this series, we've seen that we can run out on empty if we are carrying a weight that's too heavy. We can run out of fuel if we start the day with an empty tank. But listen to me, church. There is no point in doing all those things and then jumping into the day like a rabbit with its tail on fire. Okay? And look, I appreciate every now and again there'll be periods when it's intense and it's busy. So make sure that you refuel and rest. There'll be times whenever you get extra busy for a spell for whatever reason. And that's fine, but make sure you take that time to rest and, and you move things around then to reflect that. You can't live your life with your foot fat, flat to the floor. You'll burn through the fuel that you have. Remember, hurrying doesn't give you a bigger tank for you to do more. All it does is empty the tank that you have faster. You need to live at the right pace. The best pace setter is Christ. And when you live your life at his speed, walking in love, it will be good for your physical health. It will be good for your spiritual health. It will be good for your marriage. It will be good for your family. It will be good for your sanity. Slowing down and driving a wee bit more economically might just save your life. Make Psalm 51 your prayer. Even right now. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Lord, give me a clean heart, clear away the anxiety and the desire to rush and to burn through the tank that I have. Lord, set a better pace in my life. Help me to go at the pace that you set. Lord, give me a right spirit, a steadfast spirit, a steady consistency to how I live my life. Lord, help me to find the balance between working hard and being there for the people around me, to be there for my church, to be there for my children. Lord, give me the grace to say no to the things that sound good, but aren't right for me to get involved in. Lord, help me to manage my commitments so that I'm not torn, so I don't burn out. Give me the grace to say no. Help me to see what really matters. And I pray, folks, that as you do that, as, as you take on board everything that's going on in this in the world right now and how things might look differently for the foreseeable future i don't know when we're going to get back as a church i don't know if things will start up again even in september i i don't we just don't know but what we can't do is go back to the way things were where we're all just on the verge of burning out to we're, to we're just almost a breaking point that is not how god has meant it to be so take this time, make the most of it. Slow down. Stop running on empty. Uh, and, and so that whenever we then get back to normal, slowly, let's slowly figure out a better way of doing things. God bless.